happening tonight in Vancouver. The public's getting tired of it. We want to move on and we want to do our part to get rid of this, this virus as fast as we can. Social media posts are warning BC restaurants they could be targeted with fake orders as the vaccine pass comes in Monday. The industry hoping it won't amount to much. A new agreement to fast track construction on a housing project in the heart of Vancouver after more than a decade of questions and uncertainty. The details for Little Mountain and reaction from critics. I invited Mr. Blanchet to uh, get educated about systemic discrimination. I extend that invitation again. I would be happy to educate him. The federal Green Party leader makes her English language debate debut and takes the Bloc Québécois to task. This is City News Everywhere. The possibility of more protests, including at BC restaurants, looming ahead of BC's vaccination pass coming into effect Monday. The public's getting tired of it. We want to move on and we want to do our part to get rid of this, this virus as fast as we can. The hope is it goes smoothly, but they're ready for the worst as rumors are going around on social media that people protesting the vaccine pass are going to target restaurants by making multiple takeout orders, but not picking them up or paying for them. Restaurant owners are taking this in stride, saying they've already navigated mandatory masks and table limits. As always through this pandemic, we, we assume the best in people first. Um, and by and large, we've been right about that. I think we're just going to try to navigate through this day by day and just try to figure it out as a team. So I think every case will be totally different. And if the worst happens, there is help a phone call away. We've had a few of those with masks, and um, we will have a protocol where there's a quick call out to either a work safe inspector, a liquor inspector, um, a health inspector. So there's a whole army of people out to support us. And the very worst case scenario would be calling the police. But with nearly 79% of those eligible in BC already fully vaccinated and well over a million people who've already got their vaccination pass QR codes, hoping it won't come to that. I just think it's going to be right now the very small minority of angry people out there. I think they'll dissipate quite quickly when they realize that their efforts aren't going to amount to a whole bunch. Monday, people will have to prove they have one dose of vaccine at discretionary places like restaurants, stadiums, theaters and gyms, and then two doses as of October 24th. For City News in Victoria, I'm News 1130's Lisa Yuzda. Organizers of a controversial protest against vaccine passports will no longer be holding their so-called freedom movement in front of Vancouver Hospital. The Canadian Frontline Nurses Group had planned to hold a second demonstration Monday in front of Vancouver General Hospital, but an edited poster now shows Vancouver City Hall as the new location. Despite the Vancouver location change, many other protests organized by the group across the country are still planned in front of hospitals. It's unclear why the group changed its location in the city. BC is reporting 820 new cases of COVID-19 on Friday. 281 individuals are in hospital and 135 are in intensive care. That's the highest number of ICU patients since mid-May. On the vaccination front, 85.5% of eligible people 12 and older in BC have received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine and 78% received their second dose. We have a huge vacant lot year after year after year. A new deal to speed up construction of the Little Mountain housing project more than a decade after tenants were forced from a building that was demolished here. But critics are skeptical after millions of dollars lost and years of passing by this empty lot. Fences reading great stories take time to write. It might as well say it's 14 years and counting. Many families called this area home before hundreds of people were forced out. On the promise, they could return to new low-rent units here by Queen Elizabeth Park. But years passed, and many young children who lived here have all grown up. 
16 years to build, to just replace social housing that was there and a social housing community that was destroyed and people who were pushed out of their homes. People who were told they were going to be back in their new homes by 2010. So first of all, it's three and a half more years. What are they going to do? How, how is this going to take three and a half more years? On Friday, the province announced a memorandum of understanding between BC Housing, the city of Vancouver, and Holborn Properties to finish its affordable housing project by 2024. For the first time, I have some optimism, some optimism about this project, and that is in part because of some of the logistics that are set out in the MOU. Monthly meetings between the city planning department, between BC Housing and Holborn, a construction schedule that all parties agree is realistic and achievable. The MOU is simply a promise in good faith. The province is still short $211 million after the former Liberal government agreed to an 18-year interest-free loan. Holborn has only paid a $35 million down payment. And while I'm sure fingers could be pointed in many different directions, and I will point one at the previous government, um, the challenge that's in front of us in a housing crisis is to get these units built, and that's what this MOU aims at. So far, just one 53-unit social housing project is done. It doesn't look like there's a way to rewrite the sweetheart deal, and Chivnowski says any trust in Holborn is dead. We're saying take the land back. In Vancouver, Crystal Adaris, City News. The man who died Tuesday in Vancouver McDonald's drive through is being remembered as an outstanding guy, loving father, and devoted husband. 42-year-old Tony Isles had stopped at the main and terminal location at 5.30 a.m. on his way to work. He had finished paying for his food but dropped his bank card. He reached to pick it up, but his vehicle kept rolling and he was crushed between his car and the door jam. He died just a few weeks short of his and his wife's ninth wedding anniversary and leaves behind two children, eight and six, who are all heartbroken over the loss of their dad. City News spoke with the victim's brother-in-law. He put his kids, he put his wife, he put his family before anything else. You know, he had a very, very difficult job that, you know, took him away from his family quite a bit, you know, having to work downtown and Richmond and then commute back to the Maple Ridge. Um, but he did it for them. You know, everything he did, he did for them. And he did a fantastic job raising those kids with my sister. Um, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to miss their dad a whole lot. The best way to describe it, it's just a freak accident. Um, you know, we were told he, he should still be here. Um, that they're really going to have to do a good investigation on this because it, it just doesn't make sense. Many knew who knew him as well as many who didn't have taken to social media to offer their support to his family with things like meal deliveries. More than $30,000 has been raised for the family in two online fundraisers. For the third time in a year and a half, Crab Park in Vancouver has been emptied of its campers. Dozens of people were living in Crab Park in recent weeks until the space was cleared out by park rangers on Thursday. According to a Vancouver Park Board order, the southwest section of Crab Park at Portside is being temporarily closed for ground remediation. It's unclear how long the work is going to take and fences are going up while it's done. Thousands of students across BC will soon have access to new safe and accessible playgrounds as the province announced it's doubling its annual investment in the playground equipment program. This year, the PEP will invest $10 million in 60 new playgrounds in 50 school districts throughout the province. The funding for each project has also been increased by $40,000 to a total of $165,000 to better support accessible components like ground cover, ramps and or transfer platforms that connect to the play structure to ensure a place for all students to play. Playgrounds will be built over the next year. For the fourth year in a row, our government is investing in the Playground Equipment Program. And this year, we're doubling our annual, annual Playground investment to $10 million. The ongoing Playground Equipment Program recognizes the pressure on parents to fundraise. 
Parents strongly believe that accessible playgrounds should not be dependent on the school community's ability to raise funds. Since 2018, government has invested $25 million in the playground equipment program and has funded 201 new playgrounds, benefiting more than 49,000 students. We understand that there's um, the stigma for mental health is actually quite common. It's a shared human experience. It's not always easy to ask for health help, especially when it comes to mental and emotional health. How one Vancouver startup hopes to change that. I invited Mr. Blanchette to uh, get educated about systemic discrimination. I extend that invitation again. I would be happy to educate him. It's nice to want to educate This me. is my time, sir. It may have been the biggest moment of the debate, and it happened between two people who can't become prime minister. Federal Green Party leader Annemi Paul offering to educate Yves-Francois Blanchette on systemic racism. This after the bloc leader said the issue was being used to attack Quebec. Nice time to insult people. That was not an insult. It was an invitation to educate yourself. This is leader direct questions, there Melissa. Be you're some, Mr. Some Blanchet. In this debate. Blanchet was asked about his support for Quebec's Bill 21, which bans the wearing of religious symbols at work, something which a Quebec Superior Court has ruled disproportionately affects Muslim women. Blanchet says he's already acknowledged systemic racism exists, but feels Bill 21 and allegations of racism are being used against his province. The day after the debate, Blanchet reaffirmed his belief that the framing of the question was an attack. I don't know how to translate the Commission des Débats, this institution that was created by Justin Trudeau himself to, you know, coordinate or control or I don't know what the debates has started and approved the questions, the first of which was a pure aggression against Quebec values. And again, religion has never protected equality for women within the state and never will. We are not the one working with discrimination in mind. There was a time when a majority of people did not believe in giving LGBTQ people their uh, defending their human rights. There was a time when people thought that women shouldn't get the vote. There was a time where people didn't bat, bat an eye at anti-black uh, racism. And, you know, we know that that's wrong today, and it was wrong back then as well, but politicians were basically, you know, saying that, yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm willing to put up with the vilest aspects of the human character as long as it gets me into power. Fareed Khan of Canadians United Against Hate says it's disappointing that the least experienced party leader was the one to speak up, but not unexpected. Annemi Paul reiterated on Friday that her offer to educate the bloc leader was made in good faith. I believe that it is a discriminatory law. I believe that it discriminates on the basis of fundamental human rights like freedom of expression and freedom of religious expression. Um, and it's not because I'm saying that that I, I, I'm not saying it with friendship, you know. I have disagreements with people that I care about, that I love all the time. I gave the example of my husband. We've been together 30 years. Sometimes he's wrong and I tell him but it doesn't mean that I don't respect him. And it's the same thing here. The day after the debate, other federal leaders are weighing in. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau says it's wrong to assume Quebecers are racist and that the question was offensive. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole echoing those concerns, saying that he thought it was unfair to question Quebec's laws. In Ottawa, Shaoli Lee, City News. With last night's federal leaders debate in the books, Canadians who have made up their minds about who they're going to vote for are now able to get out and cast a ballot. Advanced polls opened this morning across the country for those who want to vote early or avoid long lines on election day. But the voting process will look a little different this year with several pandemic precautions in place. That includes mandatory masking and hand sanitizing stations. All the things that we're used to, we'll find like inside the polling station. So there'll be a plexiglass between you and the poll workers, a single use pencil. Um, and uh, yeah, so all of those measures, uh, social distancing as well, needs to be respected. You can check your voting card or the Elections Canada website for your nearest location. It's actually very hard to find 
platforms that can help the Asian community. Asking for help, especially when it comes to mental or emotional well-being, can be a challenge. And in some cultures, it's still considered a taboo. Now, a Vancouver-based startup wants to change the dialogue around that, offering an Asian conscious wellness platform. The aim is to try and change the way we try to find assistance, offering all sorts of different options under one website and one umbrella. Um, about 30% of our practitioners are of Asian ethnicity, but we also have other ethnicities as well. But we do ask that um, they be in mind of the cultural com competency. Janet Lam was inspired to create the startup after years of working in the stock market. She finally burned out. She got together with two other people to create the platform. I got in touch with a lot of um, these holistic therapies that really helped me and also, um, you know, have a balanced lifestyle. So I really want to share this. Accessing the holistic panda can be done all around the world with practitioners from many different places. We have practitioners from Hong Kong, New York, Toronto, Vancouver, and they offer um, alternative um, therapies like life coaching, um, fitness, nutritionist, um, traditional um, medicine. The aim is to offer services that are culturally competent, especially since mental health and wellness is still considered a no-no by some in the Asian culture. It's something Lam has firsthand experience with. Especially because our parents are immigrants and they believe that um, you have to work very hard and um, not allowed to say you're tired because that turns into weak or something wrong. She hopes that especially with the racism toward Asian people during the COVID-19 pandemic, that people are addressing their emotions. It's been very tough, especially on our mental health and unfortunately with the anti-Asian racism and all the issues going on. That's why like, I think the platform, we really want to use it to have an have the resources and tools for people to come and um, utilize it. Right now, the only way you can access the site is through theholisticpanda.com. Although Lam notes there is a phone app in the works that they hope to offer in the near future. In New Westminster, Rhea Renouf, City News. This week in science, we're outside the local aviary talking about birds who talk. Now, parrots are pretty famous for their ability to mimic human speech, but lots of different birds have the ability to make lots of different sounds. This is the Australian musk duck, so named because of the pungent odor it gives off during breeding season. It's rare to see these animals in captivity, but one hand-reared male named Ripper is the subject of some new research published by the Royal Society. Now, take a listen to this. That's Ripper saying what sounds like, you bloody fool, which is pretty salty language for a duck and probably something he picked up from his caretaker. Ripper also has a slamming door impression, which is pretty spot on. <laughs> Other musk ducks in the UK have been known to mimic human coughing, the snort of a pony, or the squeak of a turnstile. So why do any of that? While it's not totally clear, scientists do have a couple ideas of why certain birds imitate the sounds they hear. In Ripper's case, the big hint is that it happened during mating displays. In other bird news, check out this video from the Taronga Zoo in Sydney, Australia. If you had your eyes closed just now, you'd probably think that was a wailing infant. In fact, it's Echo, a superb lyre bird, one of the best vocal impressionists in the animal kingdom. In the wild, they mostly hear other birds, so that's mostly what they imitate. But in captivity, they're more likely to hear construction. Echo apparently does a near-perfect imitation of the Taronga Zoo's Evacuate Now announcement. Again, the why of all this is a bit of a mystery. While the males tend to sound off during the winter mating season, the females typically mimic the sounds of predators, which could be a form of nest defense. With This Week in Science on City News, I'm News 1130's Curtis Doring.
Vancouver's news is always available on the radio with News 1130 or online anytime at citynews1130.com. Your next edition of City News is tonight at 11 o'clock. Thanks for watching and have a great night.